Amen. All right, I want to try and preach a message to you this morning, afternoon, however you like to look at it, called Surrender Wins the Battle. Surrender Wins the Battle. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter 12, if you could for me, please. Romans chapter 12. starting at verse 1, and uh, I just want to start by just praising the Lord if I could uh, this afternoon. I'm, I'm just thankful that the Lord saved me. I, uh, it's almost unbelievable sometimes, it really is. I don't know why the Lord puts up with me, and uh, I don't know why he saw fit to save me, but I sure am thankful and glad he did. And uh, there wasn't a thing that I brought to the table that made me worth saving or anything like that. But be, well, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Knowing the state and the sinfulness and what we were in, he still died that we would have a Savior. And I'm thankful that he opened the eyes of my heart when I was 11 years old. Saved me in an old vacation Bible school. That, <laughs> at a vacation Bible school where the message was on hell. Uh, it wasn't uh, you know, a Noah's Ark theme or it wasn't any of these you know, adventure to, through time or anything like that. The preacher just opened up his Bible and he preached on hell. And uh, it resonated with me enough to where I knew I don't want to go there. I wasn't going to rest on the fact I was brought up in a godly home. I wasn't going to rest on the fact that my grandfather was a preacher. I wasn't going to rest on the fact of uh, I knew some Bible songs and Bible stories. I needed to make a decision for myself, and I needed to make it official that, Lord, I want you to save my soul. I want to be written in your book of life, and uh, I want there to be no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And at that time, when I asked the Lord to save my soul, that very instant, he came in and he saved my soul. He didn't put me on a waiting list. He didn't say, well, when you're older and you understand things a little bit better, my son, you know, I'll save you then. No, he saved me on the spot. He said to suffer little children you know, to come to him. He, he speaks to kids. He speaks to young people. He speaks to adults. And he speaks to people in the, you know, more seasoned areas of their life. He speaks to all. The difference is we've got to be able to open up our hearts. And, you know, it's like uh, people want to run from God for a long time. Stop running. And let the Lord get a hold of your heart and see what he'll do. Surrender wins the battle, folks. And I want to read to you here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to God, or according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophecy according to the propitiation or proportion of faith, I'm sorry, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhort exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dis dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly, affecting one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice. With them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but con condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire 
on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Dear Lord and precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessed, precious, infallible, perfect word. Lord, we thank you for those that are here today. Lord, I pray that you'd empty our hearts and our minds of distraction. I pray, Lord, that you help us to zone in on what you have to say to us here today, Lord. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you just have your way with each soul. Only you know and only they know where they're at today, Lord. I pray that you reach them where they're at. I pray that you empty me of myself, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me just be an instrument used by you one more time. A vessel, Lord, made of the dust of the ground. I love you. I thank you, Lord. Have your way with this message now. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when you think about winning, when you think about overcoming in a battle, uh, you certainly don't, sur uh, you don't think about surrender first. Surrender is kind of what you do when you think you're going to lose. Surrender is what you do when there is no other hope, and you're at that point just trying to save your own skin, I guess. But when it comes to your faith, when it comes to your daily battle, and you do live a daily battle, it absolutely and without question comes down to whether or not you are willing and able to surrender to God. Amen. It is all about surrender. And when you look at this, and this is a precious chapter. I love Romans chapter 12. There's so much good in it. And if the world, this lost world, would just listen to that portion of Scripture and see the attitude and the heart that God has towards His people and how we're supposed to treat the lost, and people would get a good glimpse of who God really is. I do believe that. But it starts right there in verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. God is merciful. God is merciful. Thank God we don't get what we deserve all the time. Thank God that He is merciful to us and forgiving and gracious. He is very good. It's through His mercies. But it says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, in order to present yourself a living sacrifice, there'd have to be some surrender there. Nobody would willingly go and be like, yeah, I'd love to be a sacrifice. I'll just go willingly of my own accord. But rather, to set down your own will and your own uh, agenda, your own mindset, and say, Lord, however you can use me, here I am, I, a living sacrifice. I'm here to do whatever you need me to do. There's a good attitude to have. Because there's one thing that is, uh, without question, people are in it for themselves today, make no mistake about it. People want what they want, they don't care what you want, unless you want what they want, and that is not what God wants. We want what God wants. God has His perfect will. We want to be in His perfect will. We don't want to be in His way. We want to be one that furthers the gospel of the kingdom. We want to preach the gospel that people will get saved. But we can't do that if we don't present ourselves a living sacrifice. We can't do it. When's the last time that you woke up in the morning and said, Lord, here am I, send me? Uh, but that's where we need to be. That's where we need to be. Here am I, Lord, send me. What are you afraid of? What can, what can be done to you that God would not have the final say-so over anyway? Folks, every one of us has got a trial. Every one of us has got a problem. Some of us are struggling today more than others in this church house. I look at Brother Al, and he's an encouragement to me. I had a chance to visit him the other day after he got out of surgery, and uh, surgery went well, as I understand. He's just in the process of healing, and like he was talking, today, healing hurts a little bit, but that hurting is a good way to remind you that the body is working. And uh, what he told me was, I figured if Christ can die on a cross and get whipped and have a crown of thorns on my head, and he can suffer such pain and shame for me, then certainly I can come to church today. Now, this man got, he had a heart surgery this week. What, what would your excuse be? He was cut open. And he, he keeps saying, that's not my first rodeo. I think it's said, what is it, like your fifth rodeo, right, brother? You've had a few surgeries. And here he is. What would our excuse be? There's going to be some conviction in this message today, folks. But the good news is, it's not as something, when you take the preaching and the word of God, it's meant for one thing, and that is to help you. It's not meant for you to feel like a pile of trash or something like that, and God doesn't care about me, God doesn't want to use me. There, it's about finding what's infected, finding what's wrong, locating where the issue is, and getting the medicine for it to get it fixed. It's not something like, well, then God's given up on me. I, have, I can't think of any time I've ever woke up and said, Lord, here am I, send me. The good news is, you can do it today if you really want to serve the Lord. Some of you may be, well, I would pray, but I'm afraid of what the Lord's going to ask me to do. That's an honest, at least you'd be honest, right? But he's not going to give you more than you can handle. It may just be, can you just hand out one track for me this week? Maybe there's a coworker, or a family member that just needs to hear the gospel. And he's put that person on your heart. we got brand new uh, gospel tracks up here. we got a fall theme one. we got one that says, what America needs. I'll give a spoiler alert. With America. What America needs is the gospel. They need to know. They think they know what equality is. They think they know what love is. And all they know is hate and destruction. 
God is the only one. He is love personified. And they need to get a hold of that. You want to change the country? Every one of us in here has seen the news. Every one of us in here has got a problem with that news. But I can tell you right now, if you really want to see change, you need to take the change of the people. Let's get the gospel out to these people who don't know any better. Amen. We talked about on Thursday night. We need to pray for Antifa. We need to pray for BLM. We need to pray for these ones that are taking to the streets and, and looting and burning. And that's a, Well, that's crazy, preacher. Why would you ever pray for it? Because they're lost. They're on their way with devil's hell. What they're doing is terrible. It's absolutely sinful, and, and, and it's just it's disgusting. It is. And the spirit behind these things are very satanic. If you look at what these leaders and stuff, what they believe in, it is anti-Christ. Uh, top to bottom, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. These people need saved. If God himself can save Saul of Tarsus, who is killing Christians specifically, and not only save him, but use him to preach and to plant churches, why couldn't he do that with these people? Well, that's the God back then. That, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is he not? He's still sitting on the same throne. He's still the same God. Where's our faith in that? But it all starts with, you say, well, I can't make a difference. I, you don't know what I've done, preacher. Don't care what you've done. And quite frankly, if you'll repent of it, God doesn't care what you've done either. What he cares about is that you've surrendered to him. Now he can use you. Some of you in here are carpenters. Some of you in here work well with your hands. Can you imagine what it would have been like if you really needed to use a hammer and the hammer somehow was able to fight back on you? It'd be pretty rough, wouldn't it? And, and some of you think, I've busted my thumbs enough times to say, I think the hammer is working against me. But when you have a tool in your toolbox that wouldn't want to be used, that becomes a problem. You know, no one likes to reach in, oh, I really need my hacksaw, but you realize the hacksaw got broken. Well, you can't use something that's broken. When you don't repent, when you are living in sin, when you are living the other way of the Lord, and you're a professing Christian, you've been saved, but you don't want to live for him, he can't use you. And what kind of a life is that? The Almighty would like to reach into his toolbox and say, I want to use, I want to use brother so-and-so today, I want to use sister so-and-so today. I, I can't. They don't want to be used. They're fighting me on it. They're broken. They don't want to get fixed. I can't use them. When God uses you, there's a blessing involved. You don't believe me? I dare you. Ask the Lord, what can I do for you, Lord? Listen to him, do it, and tell me you didn't. You wouldn't just thank yourself a million times over for just submitting to God one day. Think about it. Anybody who's ever done something for the Lord, put yourself aside for a second and can't tell me that, wow, why don't I live like this every day, all day? Well, because there's flesh involved. So let's look at verse 2. It says, be not conformed to this world. That kind of goes with a discussion we had in Sunday school day. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right, let's stop there for a second. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right, many of you probably are familiar with the old cartoon or whatever, the, the Transformers, the toys and stuff, robots in disguise. I think it was a theme or something. It was a little flat, so please forgive me. Uh, but, you know, it was one thing. It looked like one thing could turn into something completely different. It looked like a semi-truck turned into a big robot that could fight crime or whatever it is that he did. Uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. you got to think different if you're going to serve the Lord. And I, I'm not into, you know, adding to, to Scripture or anything like that, but if I can put a challenge forth to you, I would say it needs to be a daily renewing of your mind. We talk about a daily dying to self. It really is in the same category. Denying yourself, dying to yourself, renewing your mind, putting off the old man, putting on the new. It's something that has to be done daily. It isn't a one-time thing where, like, all right, well, Lord, uh, put off my old man today, uh, renew my mind, and I should be good for a couple months, right? you got to do it every day. You may have to do it a few times a day. Folks, this world is designed to trip you up, to get you to sin, to crush your testimony. The devil hates you. He hates the relationship that you have with the Lord. He means to destroy you. Knowing this, we have to be sober, we have to be vigilant, and we have to renew our minds. Our minds are like a sponge, and it'll soak up whatever you put in front of it, good or bad. Good or bad. It's going to suck up something. It's going to absorb something. You best put good things in front of it. You have to. Renew your mind. One day you can be out there serving the Lord and, and praising God. The next minute you may slide back into drinking a bunch of alcohol or something like that. Or saying bad words or whatever it may be. And swearing. That's not what God wants for you. But just one day I had such a victory in God. The next day I was out wallowing in hell itself. You, that's why you have to make it a daily part of your life. It's not something you can put off. Not something at all. 
We talk about the difference between spiritual and, and physical food, and I, I bet none of you in here, unless anybody is privately fasting, which that's between you and God, and I highly encourage it. But I don't think anybody in here just was like, oh, I'm just not going to eat today. Like, I'm hungry, but I'm just not going to eat. It's absurd. It's absurd. And I know the people in this church are good cooks. And some of you live with these people and know these people very well, so there's no excuse that you can't get a good meal. It would, you say, well, I would never not eat breakfast, or I would definitely never eat lunch, or I would never skip dinner, and I, I wouldn't either. But we go days on end without even picking up our Bible, let alone opening up and reading something out of it. Folks, and you know what? Don't hold yourself in comparison to what, well, that's, this, this person reads this much, and that person's been reading this program. And, man, just open it and read it. It's all good. It's all good. Read it and see what God had to say to you. Take some time and meditate on those verses. Let God speak to you. And when you're putting scripture in your heart and your mind, guess what? That's the time where bad stuff isn't getting on your heart and your mind. That's the time when you're not sinning. Those idle thoughts, all the idle time that your mind can spend and how much trouble it will get you in. Renew your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you prove it? You renew your mind. You get yourself in the right frame of mind, the right spirit to serve the Lord. And at that time, now, you can prove that which is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God because you'll be living it. You know what? Everybody wants to be an individual. Everything's about this identity. Well, I identify as this, and I identify as that. Try identifying as a Christian. You'll really turn that up on their head. They won't be able to understand it. What do you mean you don't like watching that show? What do you mean you don't like that dirty joke? What do you mean you don't like going there to hang out? Who cares if people are half-dressed and things like that? It's different. That's different. You want to stand out? And that shouldn't be your, well, how can I stand out today? shouldn't be your motivation, but how can I stand up for Jesus? You will stand out. And I think a lot of times the people in the church, they're afraid to do it because they know the power of God and what it will have on their lives. And they know there'll be earthly consequences by the people that they keep their company with if they'll stand up for Jesus. Folks, it's necessary. If not you, then who? It's always, well, someone else will pick up the slack. But you know what ends up happening? Nobody picks up that slack. You know what? These uh, hate groups, the terrorist groups, and, and uh, all these different ones, they don't have a bit of trouble gaining, uh, gaining members for their cause. They're not sleeping on, you know, they're using their social media platforms and stuff to build up their cause. They're talking to other people and, and you know, and, and building up their cause and building up their numbers and stuff. But Christians, well, I don't want to offend anybody. Come on! They, they don't give a hoot if you're offended. And you're not out to offend, but the preaching of the Word of God, it's enmity against the world. And because of that, guess what? It's going to ruffle some feathers. whoop de doo At some point, whose side are you on? Who saved you? Your aunt and uncle or Jesus Christ? Your co-worker that if you had to move or something tomorrow, they would be the furthest away from you they possibly could. Oh, everything would come up. You can't count on me. But you know what? They'd ask anything of you. That person didn't save you. Jesus Christ saved you. Your boss didn't save you. Jesus Christ saved you. And I'm not saying to disrespect anybody or anything like that. But man, we'll knock ourselves over. We'll bend over backwards for people who wouldn't give a hoot about us if we lay dead in the street. But Jesus Christ is in there with his arms wide open. Brother, sister, my, my son, my daughter, I will give you the blessings that are in this book if you just listen to my word. Pass. Nope. Thanks anyway. That might hurt somebody's feelings. People are too soft anyway. You can use a tough thing up. <laughs> Give them some Bible. We're only two verses into a 21 verse chapter. My word. <laughs> verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Think like a Christian, not a carnal individual. Think like a Christian, not a carnal individual. Be humble. Having God's measure of faith supplies your humility. One of the things, when you talk about daily renewing your mind, it's a daily mission to stay humble as well. It is so easy for the flesh to start wanting to take credit for things, thinking it's bigger than it is. Well, I grew up, look, I, I had grandparents that you know, came from uh, Appalachia, if you will. Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, the South. 
And a phrase that I heard a lot growing up is don't get too big for your britches. Don't get too big for your britches. And uh, there's a lot of truth in that. Folks, you know what? Well, we are just dust from the ground after all. I'm not talking about beating yourself up and, you know, never being happy or anything like that. I'm not talking about that. But don't get too high and mighty. Understand that we take every breath we have because the good Lord says we can. That, I mean, that's it. That's it. God allows you to wake up today. There are people who, there were people last night that died in their sleep. Didn't count on that happening. People die in car accidents and stuff all the time. Things that happen, you don't know. Your life is a vapor. You're here for a minute and gone the next. It really is quick. Spend your time in humility. You know, being a sports fan, you know, there were athletes I liked growing up and athletes that even played for my team I couldn't give two thoughts about because they were jerks. They, you know, they, they'd, they'd give an interview or something. You can tell the people. Jim Tomey was my favorite Cleveland Indian. They always will be. That guy was as nice as could be. He'd give people all sorts of time of day. Uh, I remember, my dad got a chance to meet him one time. He, he got a, a pass into the dugout, got to meet the, uh, the Indians of the 90s. I mean, if you knew, man, that was the team. That was the best team to never win at all. And, uh, man, I about it. But the whole point of it is there are some people he got to meet that were really nice. He's a manager, Mike Hargrove, super nice guy. Jim Tomey, he said, you're a big hulking man, you're big like a Paul Bunyan type character. Come over and give him a big hand shake. He says, sir, thank you for so, so much for coming to support our team. Thank you so much for being a fan. We really appreciate it. Like, what athlete thinks to do that? Like, hey, thanks for spending your money. Why don't you get season tickets while you're in here and buy a few souvenirs for the kiddos and all? No, he said, I, I just appreciate you supporting us. Then there was others, and my dad said, well, I'd really like to get his autograph. Oh, he won't even give you the time of day. Went up to someone else, hey, can I have your autograph? I've got two little boys at home that just think the world your autograph, and I don't got time for you. Straight up to his face. See the difference? Uh, somebody who's humble and, and has humility and is kind to other people, who would you want to be around? I don't care how much you know, uh, money someone makes or how good they are or what they do. They don't give a hoot about you. They don't care. But that humble person, that's the one you remember. That's the one that you like. Now think about how you act. Are you a humble person? Are you somebody that you do magnify the Lord when someone said, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, Brother John does such a great job singing and, and playing instruments. Brother Carl does such a, job, a good job singing. Sydney, she's not here today, but she does a great job playing her instruments. My wife does a good job coming up here playing the piano, among so many others that do so much here. And I'm thankful that not one of them, at least not that I've ever heard, like, hey, do you like my singing today? Did you catch that little ditty I did on the piano up there? Pretty slick, huh? That was all me. You don't hear that. Praise God. You know why? Because there's some humility out there. Because you know what? I'm sorry, but if God doesn't give you a talent to play piano, you're probably not going to be able to play piano. Not well. I mean, you can hit the keys, but it can be pretty rough. And that's okay. You know, God doesn't make everybody a musician or a singer or anything like that. But knowing that God gave the ability, not you, See, some people say, well, that, I mean, I worked hard. I took lessons and stuff. Well, yeah, you've got to practice, and there's things like that. Absolutely. God doesn't give people a gift, and all of a sudden you're a genius at it and never have to spend any time on it. But he gave you a gift, and, it, and he gives you the opportunity as a gift to do with it what you want. Think of it this way. If somebody was to give me, uh, I don't know, uh, a, new, uh, a new golf club. My driver's wearing out, just for anybody who was wondering. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. If someone give me a new golf club, a free gift, somebody gives it to me, it's a gift. It's right-handed, so I don't have to worry about taking it back because it's left-handed. It fits me. It's, it's the way I swing and all that stuff. It's just the way I like it. It's not real flexible. It's, got, it's the head on it I like and stuff. It's just what I want. Somebody gives me this gift. It's like, wow, awesome. I'll go get something else. I'm going to do something else with it. What a waste. People spent the time and the money to go and do something nice for me and get me that golf club and then just, no thanks. Just disregard and throw it aside. How many people do that with the gifts that God's given them? I mean, good gifts. Good gifts. I'm telling you, you may say, well, what's my gift? I, you know what? I think cleaning is a gift. I think cleaning is a gift. I do. You can tell people that you clean and can't. Or don't. Maybe that's the better word. Not that they can't, that they don't. 
But cleaning is a gift. And when people put a skill of cleaning to the church, do you not notice it? Amen. There's people who are really good at cutting grass. Do you know that? Put someone on a mower and don't know how to mow a straight line and then have someone who can. Tell me who you want to mow your lawn. It's a gift. Some people are just, they can do that. Some people are really good with their hands, mechanics and things like that. Some people are good with cars. Some people are good with plumbing and roofing and all these things. Some people can sing. Some people can teach. Some people can tolerate little children for a really long amount of time and be super patient. That's a gift. You think, well, this is, you know, you say, well, my gift's welding. What do we, who knows who you can witness to when you're on the job welding something? The church may need something welded one day. You may be the only person who can slide in and out. It may not be a daily situation, but it could be a, a certain... It's a gift. God gives it to you. Oh, and you could go down the line for how many of these uh, singers and stuff that are out there today. All, oh, I started singing in my church. I sang in the choir. I sang specials at church. And now they're out there singing for the devil. A gift that God gave them, but they're ruining it. They're ruining it. One thing was so one of uh, one of my brother and sister in laws they got all of our remote controlled cars. Now, to be fair, the box says six and up. He is not six yet <laughs> at all. Uh, I think he was maybe three. It might have been two actually when he got it. But we'll give the benefit of the doubt and call it three. He's happy. Age. I had fun with it. It was a nice remote controlled car. I was zipping around the living room and stuff, but he just didn't understand. He had he had a nice gift and he destroyed it. Busted the wheels right off the thing. Well, he wasn't ready for the gift, but the problem is, you get a nice gift, and sometimes you, 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 don't, you don't handle it right. You tear something up right there in your own hands. What I'm trying to say is this. God gives us everything we'll ever need. We kind of went over that Thursday, really. But he gives you everything, absolutely everything you ever need. He's good to you, and he made you specifically. That's a wonderful thing. I'm thankful that God did that. But it is so sad when people don't live up to their godly potential and what they can do for the Lord. Or when they do do something, it's look at, it, hey, you ever see it? You know, you ever see any better? You know, I, I remember uh, work day, I think it was last year, and uh, it was raining real bad. Dennis was out there. I didn't. I, I thought he left. Dennis was out there. He's on a, a ladder, and he's got a bucket of paint on his arm. He just slapped it along. They're just getting as much done as he can. But you know one thing? Dennis never came back to me later and be like, hey, what do you think of that paint job? Best you've ever seen, right? Didn't do that. Didn't do that. He said, hey, just happy to help. Man, that's a good attitude. That's a Christian attitude. That's humility. To summarize verses 4 through 8, and we're not going to get done with it in time. That's okay. We'll go until the Holy Spirit says stop. It says, we are one, basically, we are one body, but many members. Surrender to self and do what God tells you to do by the gifts of he has given you. So that piggybacks over the last point, but I want to actually sit and think about this. The body and its many members. All right? Now again, Brother Al went in to have uh, surgery on his heart. Or, what was it? Gallbladder. gallbladder. I'm sorry. Big difference in that order. <laughs> but nevertheless, he needs that gallbladder. I'm sorry about that. He needs that gallbladder. Guess what? If he didn't have a gallbladder, he'd notice real fast. If that thing completely gave out and he couldn't get help, he'd notice real fast. And to be fair, you would with the heart, too. But <laughs> that was my fault. But you've got an issue. And the rest of your body could be doing fine. But guess what? When you're hurting somewhere, all you can think about is that spot that hurts. Right? Now, you think about, we talked about this morning in Sunday school, the church. It's a call out assembly, right? The body of believers. <coughs> Miss Lori's not here today. Miss Lori's been sick. And you pray for her. You know when she's not here. The body hurts a little bit today because she's not here. Miss Shirley's not here today. She's sick. The body hurts a little bit because there's two people right off the top of my head that aren't here. You notice it. It hurts a little bit. You see... Nobody in here would be like, if you lost half of your right leg or something, like, yeah, no, no big deal, I'll just hop right along like nothing's going on. You're going to struggle a little bit. If you're, you know, if you were missing your, you know, if you're right-handed, you missed your right hand, guess what? Life just got a lot more difficult. Now you got to learn how to do things left-handed. The church is the same way. Folks, it's a good thing to be here. 
I don't have one of those old-fashioned boards that they usually put up right over here that says last week's attendance, Sunday school attendance, last week's offering, this week's offering, and stuff like that. I'm not a, I'm not a numbers-driven person. But I'm a, a people-driven person. And I know that when you're here, you're safe, you're in a good place, you're in a place where there's a God that loves you and there's people that love you. And if you're not here, I do get concerned. I, I don't know what's going on. Are you okay? I hope so. That's the motivation. Because it's a body. When the body's not at full strength, it's hurt, it's sick. It struggles a little bit. And you're important to God and to his family. And you may say to yourself, well, I'm not a big giver. Oh, well, you're welcome here. You may say, well, I don't really have much. I don't know that I can even bring to the table. Oh, well, you're welcome here. Better to be in here than out in the world, I can tell you that. Better to be out here where you can be loved on and you can be encouraged and strengthened. Convicted from time to time to fix those things where you've gone off kilter a little bit on your life. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, I, people get funny about stuff like that. But I tell you, I, I get excited when you get a visitor come in. I do. I get excited when you see someone you haven't seen in a long time. Man, just happy to have you. I'm gonna go and hound someone. Where have you been the last couple weeks? Thank you for being here today. What matters is today. Tomorrow's gone, and you don't know if, uh, or yesterday's gone, you don't know if tomorrow's coming. I'm thankful you're here today. That's all I know. Let the Lord work in a person's heart. We all got enough things to work on, but the body, we want to keep it at full strength. Be here when you can. Verse 9, surrender the ways of the hypocritical love, and be real. You know, the world's full of fake people. Full of fake people. Oh, they'll smile at you and say, oh, praise God, brother, bless your heart. Yes, sister, anything I can do for you, oh, yeah. But when push is coming to shove, not around. Oh, I love you and stuff, and then as soon as they get a chance to go behind your back, it starts, start biting at it. Backbiters. Things like that. Hypocritical love. Well, you can put on a good face, you can put on a good show, but in your heart, there's no love there. It's hypocritical. It says, let your love be without dissimulation. That is verse 9. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. One of the terms that people like to use a lot today, toxic people. Oh, people are so toxic. I don't want those toxic people in my life. That's a good idea. You shouldn't have toxic people in your life if you could help it. And if there's people, there's nothing else you can do because there's toxic people in your life. Well, the best thing that you can do, you don't. Uh, you, you ever hear the term kill them with kindness? You kill them with kindness. Not literally. Don't kill anybody. But metaphorically. What kind of world do we live in where you just treated people based on how they treated you? Especially you being a Christian. How many of you know the golden rule? Matthew 7, 12. And to paraphrase it, and everybody kind of knows the gist of it, hey, do unto others as you have done unto yourself. If you don't like people being mean to you, then don't be mean to other people. If you don't like people talking about you, then don't talk about other people. And the list goes on and on. I'll wrap the rest of this up. With the, actually verses 19 through 21, we'll go to the end of the chapter. It says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I really want to focus on verse 20, because... I think this country is more political than it's ever been. Um, I think it's more divided, at least as far as what you get on the news, than it's ever been. I'll be honest with you, in my daily running around and stuff like that, no one's treated me different. No one's been mean to me. But that's just me. Maybe you've had some run-ins, I don't know. Maybe you've had to go through Louisville lately, or Chicago, or Portland, or any of these other places. I don't know, L.A., I, I, whatever. But I'll say this. 
If your enemy's hungry, would you feed them? Or would you kick at them and say, get out of here, you get what you deserve? That's how you, you want to act that way, and that's what you get. Well, that may make your flesh feel real good. Ha ha, you got what you deserve, that's what you have coming. What does the Bible say? Your enemies, feed them. If they thirst, give them drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. What do you think that means? You think about that for a second. Heap uh, coals of fire on his head. It'll burn him up. You ever been in a situation where something just frustrated you a point where it just burns you up? That's just a, that's a phrase my grandma used. Like, oh, it just burns me up. They can't comprehend it. They expect you to be mean back. That's the norm. That's really what people expect. If, they, if someone's mean to you, they expect you to be mean back. Not to be like, listen, you know what? Here, let, let me take, let me get you some food. Let me get you something to drink. Let me take care of you here tonight. What, didn't you just hear what I said? Blank you and all that stuff and everything you stand for for that Jesus and all that. Yeah, I know what you said. Here, let me. What can I do for you tonight? What kind of world would we live in if we had a few more Christians that did that? And then, folks, again, all this is tough. That's what we talk about. It's a renewing of your mind. It is not natural to think this way. I want you to know that. Yeah, just because you're saved, and it, if you're saved today, you still have a struggle with the outer man. You've got the inner man, that born-again man, but you've got the outer that still desires the things of this world, still remembers what you did when you were lost, still craves the things at times that you did when you were lost, that you've got to fight with and you've got to renew with. And if you're truly saved, I don't think anybody here would say, boy, if I could get a refund on my salvation, I would. I don't think anybody here would say that. If so, then you need to get saved in the first place. I don't think a Christian could ever say that. And if you'd really want to be honest with yourself, you say, when I'm close to the Lord, I, I don't ever really want to leave. But you'll leave. Come back. Come back. We think too much of finality. Well, I failed the Lord, and I did this, and I got away from him for a little while, so he'd never want me back. Sure he does. You ever read the prodigal son? In plainer terms, that, that younger son, he was a jerk to his dad. Just to put it out, there he was. Give me your inheritance. Give me my inheritance. The guy wasn't dead. Usually you get your inheritance when the parent passes away, and then it really gets ugly, and some of the worst scenes you've ever... <laughs> that's bad. Dad's still very much alive. Like, I'm, basically what he's saying is, I'm sick of you. I'm sick of your rules, living at your house, doing your work. I know you got, I got money coming my way that you earned your whole life. Give it to me so I can go and be frivolous with it and stupid with it. And uh, I don't care about anything that you've ever done for me. Dad says, okay. Here you go. So he takes all he has. Do, 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 do. I'm living it now. I go to the city and I start blowing my money and stuff like that and getting all the pleasure of this world. And I bet for a time he was living it up. He was a big deal. The big cheese. You know, he had all the money. He was spending it. Probably buying drinks for everybody and, uh, and whatever it is and buying big lavish things. But there came a day where his money ran out. And he looked to just get a job as a servant. And he was down there feeding the hogs. Now listen, for a Jew, that, that's bad. They don't think much of pigs. They're very dirty. And he feigned that he would eat the husks that they fed the hogs with. But then he came to himself. And he re remembered he had a father. Amen. And if he could just come back and be a servant to his dad, not even just be a son, but if I could just come back and be a servant, that would be much better than the state I'm in right now. While he was yet afar off, his father seen him. And what did he do? My little brat's back. I can't wait to give him a piece of my mind. Nope. Turn his back on him and say, nope, you're dead to me. I don't have another son. Nope. He ran out and met him, and he fell on his neck and kissed him. Put a ring on his finger. Said, go out and let's, let's slay the calf. Let's go have ourselves a feast, for my son was lost, and now he's found. That's your God. I don't care if you've ran away from him for decades. He's still your father, if you're saved. Come on back, and he'll do the same thing. He'll fall on your neck, he'll kiss you, and say, Welcome back, my child. I missed you. And he'll be like, oh, You're dead to me. Get out of here. You made your choice. Nope. God's gracious and he's merciful, and you'll come back and you'll repent of what you did. And, and that's what the, the prodigal son did. He repented because he came back to where he belonged. That's what God's looking for. People are willing to be obedient, to repent, present themselves a living sacrifice. Things that are a daily challenge, but nothing that you can't handle. Let's stand on our feet and let's bow our heads in a word of prayer.